Furniture is designed to be moved by the users, regardless of what physical plant rules are imposed on it. Light bulbs are intended to be easily removed and replaced. It's just they hope that physical plant does it, not faculty and not students. Thermostats should be used by uh, the users to set the temperature. Um, and engage with space uh, in that way, adjust our temperature until we're comfortable. But what do we do when we want to, uh, is, first of all, is, any, is everyone a comfortable temperature? Does anyone have any breeze on them that is making them uncomfortable? But sometimes we do have breezes on us in these rooms that make us uncomfortable. What do we do then? We find the breeze, and then what do we do? Stop it if it's that big of a deal. How do we stop it? Cover up wherever it's coming through. Like that? That's light. Someone was annoyed by that light, so they hung totally gorilla rogue move, right? They hung that paper to reduce the glare of the light, right? Totally rogue mood. move. There we go. I knew. Um, so where's the thermostat? There is one. I think that's physical. Normally we have to call them if we want to change the temperature. Interesting. Don't the uh, crit rooms with the ACs in them have thermostats? I think so. I, I think because of that, yeah. this one doesn't have. Okay, so that comes up in this. I'm going to give a lecture. I'm going to try to stop talking to you so much and just deliver some content um, because I haven't done much of that yet. I just interrogate you in an improv manner. Um, if I were you, I would want some content delivery out of this class for once. Um, unfortunately, there's a, this is a huge amount of content um, it's a big topic. Uh, it's something that I have changed my life in order to give you this lecture. I took a sabbatical year. I applied for a grant. I got a grant. I moved my family to live in Colombia, also totally against the rules of the Wentworth Institute of Technology. At the time, there was a State Department warning uh, saying U.S. citizens are advised not to travel to Colombia. And that makes it illegal for me to go, not illegal, but it, I had to break the rules of the Institute at the time in order to go. So if you wanted to blackmail me, you could try to say that I told you this. Um, but here's why I did it. It's so I could deliver a better lecture to you. And so here it is. This is the new and improved lecture. Yes? Is your note still on the fridge? What is it? No. It's gone. Oh, I that have it still. He did. He <laughs> took it off and he said, did you put this on here? And I said, how did you know? And he said, well, you're the kind of person who would put this on. He didn't. I wasn't interested in Latin America. I didn't speak Spanish. I'd never been anywhere south of Texas. Um, but somehow he knew it was me, which I, I, I take as a compliment. So um, let's get into it. So this is a structure of ideas. This is the author's structure of ideas, um, which may or may not be adequate for your purposes. So if you're doing a sketch writing about this content, this is a useful frame of reference that the author is uh, supplying to you. But it's not sufficient. You have to aggressively engage this content and say, well, first of all, there was a whole thing before you even started the lecture that is another part of the structure of this lecture. So uh, before reflexive, there should be a whole other topic heading, maybe three topic headings, right? Depending on, I, you know, I suggest you ignore the whole video thing that wasn't part of the lecture, although that was also a demonstration of reflexive 
thinking. I don't want to be the planner, the controller of the video content. I want it to be a responsive system behavior that at any point in time when you have a video to upload, you just do it without thinking about it. You just do the thing you do, you know, Alexa, upload my video for this week, boom, and it goes, right? You don't need me, you don't need permissions, all your passwords are stored and it just goes, right? That's a reflexive system response. So you could think of that as being part of the lecture, or you could say, I'm gonna ignore all that. That was just logistics. That's up to you, okay? So the first part, reflexive. What is reflexive, right? Everyone cross their leg. And see if you can trigger a, a reflexive response. You have to cross your leg like this. This is a class requirement. I'm grading you. Did you already do it? So now, okay, fake it. Someone fake it. Who's going to fake it? I'm not faking it. Ali's faking it, right? Can you tell he's faking it? Yes. <laughs> I'm not faking it, right? That's real. That's when you have to say, am I? Right? So we can tell when someone's faking it and when they're not faking it, right? How can we tell? We, we know what it feels like, and we've experienced it. So through empathy, so through empathic rec recall, we know when someone's faking a reflexive response and when they're not. Well, actually, we'd call that a reflex response. So that's the first root of the word reflexive, is it's, it's automatic. It's not, it doesn't require a committee to sit down and plan and figure out and make a decision. It's automatic, it just happens. It's built into the system when if A, then B. What does that sound like? If A, then B. Have you heard that language Science. before? Science, more specific? Hypothesis. What is it? Hypothesis. Mm, close. But it's a specific way of talking that a whole class of professionals use. If A, then B, comma, else C. Computer science? Computer science, thank you. That is the structure of an if-then statement, a conditional statement. If this condition is met, then this is the response. Otherwise, this response. If this, A, then B, else C. It's inherent in the structure of all computer languages. If you know JavaScript, if you know C+, if you know any of these languages, that is the basic equation of all circuits. Um, we used to call them transistors or tubes, but we went from, trans we went from tubes to transistors in the 50s, we had the solid state revolution in electronics. Then we went to uh, digital systems. And so we don't even use transistors anymore. We use Arduino boards. Or res do you, do you, does anyone do Arduino? Sometimes it's useful in Architecture Studio if you want to create uh, a responsive system. And we're going to see some examples of this at the end if we get to there. So. This reflexive mechanism is actually inherent in all computer-based systems, which makes it, so that's a hint, it's something that is of, it is increasingly ubiquitous in the 21st century. Ubiquitous means pervasive. Pervasive means everything, like smartphones, smart refrigerator, smart pillow, smart bag, smart block of wood, Right? You can buy a block of wood with a USB port and it'll, it turns out it's $549 for a 2x4 that has a chip in it that will tell you the weather, all kinds of things. Um, and it basically, this is another important system that we were just talking about. This is the characteristic system diagram. 
of a feedback loop. So when, before the invention of the thermostat, we would sit in this room and we would say, I'm chilly, and we would turn on the heat, and it would go on, and it would get hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter until we said, man, it's hot in here, and then we would turn off the heat, and then it would get cooler and cooler and cooler until someone said, hey, man, it's cold in here, and they turn on. Right? You build a fire, you let the fire die down. And that was boring. And so in 1883 or somewhere around there, uh, they invented the thermostat. And the thermostat is the classic negative feedback loop. What makes it negative is that it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. I'm, test I'm checking the output for how hot it's getting. And then I'm going to, when it gets too hot, when it reaches the set point, I'm going to give it a negative signal. I'm going to say, negate that, turn it off, boom, and the heat will turn off. And then there's a, uh, there's, and then when it hits the bottom set point, it is a negative, negative, another negative signal. It says, turn it on, reverse what I said before, change your state, negate your state, now turn it on, and so now it turns on. And that's a negative feedback loop. If it were a positive feedback loop, who plays the electric guitar? So positive, what's a positive feedback loop? Yeah, I just play it as like a hobby. You, what? I just play it as like a hobby. Well, then you probably do. It's an electric guitar, not a acoustic. Yeah, electric. So, so hit a, hit a note, okay. bang, right? And then go over to the speaker. Yeah, and that's the positive feedback loop? Yeah. So what's happening? That's, are you talking about like the static you'll get? Or like the actual noise coming from the air? Is that where it like rings really loudly? Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. that static you get. Yeah. And in a different version of this lecture, I show a video clip of Jimi Hendrix playing the Star Spangled Banner. Do you know that? It goes, bam, 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 bang, <laughs> Right? He's putting the guitar up to the speaker, the, the, no, the sound from the speaker is hitting the, the string, causing it to vibrate even more. So the more, the more that string vibrates, the louder the speaker gets, the harder it drives the string, the more it vibrates until the system kind of breaks and you, you hear the screeching feedback sound. That's positive feedback. Also the characteristic of nuclear power, the hotter a nuclear power pile, a, a fission pile gets, the faster the reaction uh, grows and the more heat is produced. And so that's a positive feedback loop. Friends don't let friends let their nuclear power fission pile get too hot, right? Because the hotter it gets, the faster it heats up, the hotter it gets, and then what happens? Chernobyl. Chernobyl. China syndrome. It melts all the way to China, which it wouldn't do because gravity, it would stop at the core of the planet. Right. And China's not the other side of the world anyway. It's, uh, everyone knows it's just off the coast of Australia and Tasmania. This is a governor. Does anyone understand how this works? They spin, don't they? This spins. Um, so this is connected by a pulley to the drive shaft of, let's say, a tractor or a car. And, um, well, no car now, because cars are all electronic now. But back when we used to have mechanical systems, this, uh, a belt would be attached to the drive shaft. The faster the shaft of the engine uh, goes, the faster this pulley spins, and the centrifugal force would drive these ball, these weights out, which, because of this pivot and this mechanism, would pull this down. The further these drive out, the further this pulls down, which pulls that up because of this pivot, which pulls that arm, which closes the throttle. So there's two controls on the throttle. One is the pedal that you can accelerate the engine by 
opening the throttle by pushing the pedal. The other is uh, if, if the pedal is not pushing it full, it's just idling, uh, the governor controls the speed of the engine. If the engine starts going too fast, the governor, uh, the balls move outward and it automatically closes the throttle, feeding less fuel to the engine. So it will slow down. And as it slows down, the balls go down. This goes up and it opens up the throttle. So this is a governor. It's named the governor because it governs automatically without anyone talking to it. Uh, no decision is being made except in the uh, design and calibration of this mechanism. Does that make sense? So this is a feedback loop. It's a negative feedback loop. As it goes positive, as in faster, this says, no, no, negative feedback. I'm giving you negative feedback. Let's slow it down a little. Oh, too slow. Let's speed it up a little, right? Does that make sense? So this is a negative feedback loop. This is a reflexive system behavior. Did anyone study economics? In high school. Excellent. Do you know what that is? Supply and demand. How does supply and demand work? Um, well, when people want something, so let's like, say like an iPhone. Um, when people, when the new iPhone gets released, a lot of people want it. So uh, the price is kind of, um, I guess an iPhone is kind of a bad example because they're pricey anyway. But let's say like the price st starts lower, but then as people stop wanting it, the price gets higher. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is the other way around. I Perfect. That was a reflexive response right there. You can say anything you want. It can be right or wrong. We got your back. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. This is down. Yeah. This is down. Yeah. Yep. Ah. No, that's not. Thank you. That was a reflexive system behavior right there. I got you back. Thank you. <laughs> friends don't let friends get it wrong. That's why we go to architecture schools to be critiqued on the, onto the right track. So yeah, you know, supply and demand, it's an automatic system. No one is making a decision about what the price should be, ideally. Apple's a bad, the iPhone's a bad example because it's a monopoly and we'll get into that. That's the, that's the breakdown of reflexive system behaviors. But let's say in other countries where there are hundreds of phone services, how much does, uh, do people's cell phone service cost in other countries? About one-tenth of what you pay. That's because they have competition. Uh, when uh, one company raises their monthly rate, the other company says, thank you very much. I will capture more market share. I'm going to keep my monthly rate low. I'm going to attract a larger market share. And in response, the person who just, the company that just raised their monthly rate, they would say, oh shit, I'm losing market share. They drop their price uh, until, uh, you know, until it, the system is self-correcting. No one is making a decision uh, on the, the entire system until you get to the United States. And that's how we get $40, $50 a month for a cell phone plan. Right? You, got, you guys who have been overseas lately, how much do you pay over there? $10 per month. Really? But with Turkish money. Yeah. In Thailand, it's like $20, $20. Twenty dollars a month. Yeah. Okay. So, short video about the prisoner's dilemma. Do you know about the prisoner's dilemma? Two people. They committed a very serious crime, but there's no proof, and so the police try to convict them. 
on a lesser offense. And they separate them and they put them in separate interrogation rooms. It, they say, okay, don't say anything, and they make a deal, but then they're in separate. And if they both stay silent, then they will only go to prison one year each for the minor crime. If they both betray each other, then they'll both go to prison for two years each. Okay, each partner can do one of two things, stay silent or betray. Staying silent would be cooperating, and betraying would be defecting. If they both stay silent, then they each spend a year in prison. If one betrays and the other stays silent, then the betrayer goes free, and the silent spends three years in prison. If they both betray, then it's two years each. So what are they going to do? Well, they should cooperate. That's the best option for the group, if we add the total number of years in prison. But let's take it from Red's perspective. If she thinks Blue is going to stay silent, then she should betray so she can go free. Going free is better than spending a year in prison. If she thinks he's going to betray her, then she should definitely betray. Two years in jail is better than three and being made a fool of. Blue is in the exact same situation and will think the exact same thing. He should betray if she stays silent, and he should betray if she betrays. They should have both cooperated, but from an individual standpoint, they notice they could always gain by defecting, if they have no control over what the other person's going to do. So they'll both defect to try to better their own situation, but come away not only hurting the group, but themselves. Individually, they're worse off than if they both cooperated. This situation is pretty made up, but it has some real-world analogs. A common example is with marketing. Let's say two cigarette companies, Red Strikes and Smooth Blue, are deciding how much money they should spend on advertising. Since the product they each make is identical to one another, advertising has a huge impact on sales. For simplicity, let's say their choices are to advertise a bunch or not advertise at all. And there's just 100 people in this society and they all smoke. If both don't advertise, then just by random chance picking cigarette boxes, 50 people buy Red Strikes and 50 people buy Smooth Blue. At $2 a pack, they each make $100. Let's say advertising costs $30. If one person advertises and the other does not, then 80 people will buy the cigarettes from the ads and 20 people buy the other ones. The advertiser makes $160 minus $30 for ads and comes away with $130. The non-advertiser didn't spend any money but only made $40. If they both advertise, again, half will buy Red Strikes and half will buy Smooth Blue. But since they both spent $30 on advertising, they only come away with $70 each. Same deal, both people cooperating and not advertising is the most preferable situation. But both companies can see that advertising will always make them more money. But unlike the prisoners in jail, these companies can talk and try to influence each other. From here, Blue would be better off if Red didn't advertise. Red wouldn't go for that because that would be worse for them. Blue could try to convince Red that they would both not advertise, the only other situation where they're both better off. But without any real obligation to each other, there's nothing that's stopping them from trying to advertise to gain more of the market anyway. If you think your opponent's gonna not advertise, then you're better off advertising. Although, we're still making assumptions to make this situation work too. With this model, we're assuming they only play once. The game changes when the players have a chance to build a relationship and work together to get more gains over time, or punish each other by not cooperating. Also, to make the model work, we have to make up rules for the players. Assume they're basically computer programs with predictable actions. These guys are creepier than they were in my head. They were supposed to be cute. For the prisoner's dilemma and other similar models, we're assuming they are rational agents. A rational agent is a hypothetical person that will always pick the option that they predict will work out best for them. They're not really thinking about the gains of someone else. Seems selfish, but it is something that real people generally do too. People always want what's best for themselves, and we don't like to be made a fool of. But if you put real people in the prisoner's dilemma, people don't always defect like the model predicts. In one study, 40 people playing Prisoner's Dilemma games through a computer without ever meeting or talking, only playing each opponent once, these are one-off games, using a payoff matrix that looks like this, cooperated an average of 22% of the time. These people never cooperated, these people always cooperated, these guys cooperated on half of their games and everyone else is in between. This is a lot of cooperation coming from a model that predicts no cooperation. The largest group did act like rational agents, but most people tried to cooperate at least once. It's because well, there's more to real people. We are social creatures, and even in one-off scenarios with no guarantees or obligations and no chance to build a relationship, we're still thinking about how the group might decide. We're actually thinking from the perspective of the group and making an optimistic decision. Cooperating an average of 20% of the time might not seem very optimistic, but remember this is with absolutely no communication or obligations. 
Anyways, that's not really the point. Using rational agents is still useful. The model is just trying to point out the dilemma of certain situations where people are actually hurting themselves when counterintuitively they're only thinking about themselves. And that's why we're modeling using the cold robotic psychopaths. <laughs> So this is a classic example of a reflexive system. Uh, so two, we now have two reflexive systems coming out of the world of economics. We have the, the, the automatic balancing of supply and demand that is part of classical economics. Um, classical economics also assumes rational agents pursuing their own self-interest will yield the best outcome for everybody. That is the prime directive of classical economics. But then we have the prisoner's dilemma, which is a thought model. And this guy, Jesse, uh, did a great job identifying the assumptions of this model, showing that it's, it's limited. But in its pure form, the prisoner's dilemma demonstrates a reflexive system that uh, favors the most negative outcome possible. Now, which of those two, uh, thinking about the Anthropocene and uh, the, the driving forces of climate change, um, can you think of which of those two systems do you think uh, best matches what we're seeing in global climate change? Is in it what created the problem or in trying to solve it? In what created the problem. People pursuing their own self interest. Well they're not really aware of what created the problem or they're not what, there's no exact detail of what they have their own thoughts of what could have created it and there's so many mm -hmm. um, and that like answers to that one question that it can create conflict and disagreements that will not be unsolved or that may affect the process of trying to fix it. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Basically, it's complicated. It's hard to identify what the real cause of the problem is. But some have pointed out, um, including Garrett Hardin in 1968, he raised the question of the prisoner's dilemma and he uh, resurrected this piece of literature from eight from the early night from almost a hundred years earlier that uh, an amateur mathematician uh, looked at what he called the tragedy of the commons have you ever heard of tragedy of the commons your high school economics teacher didn't so well I'm gonna let the animation do the job that's what YouTube is for I'm going to skip that one and just do this one. This is a model called the tragedy of the commons, which should be called the problem with open access since it has little to do with the commons, and tragedy is kind of dramatic. Let's say there's some land with grass on it that people use as pasture for their animals. Nobody owns it, and anyone can come and graze their livestock here. We're like Boston Common. We don't communicate or work together, so we would call this an open access field. Assume the number of animals this field can feed is based on the quantity and quality of the grass, which is based on the health of the soil. And it can only hold this many animals. This is the carrying capacity. If animals are added beyond this, the grass can't regrow fast enough to support them all. Also, the grass protects the soil from erosion. <coughs> too many animals are around the field may decline in productivity, lowering the carrying capacity. The animals will be less healthy and provide lesser quality products, lowering the profit each animal provides. So it's in this group's best interest to keep the number of animals on the field at or below the carrying capacity. But every herdsman that puts an animal on the field will get the direct benefit that that animal provides for them, but they would only share a portion of the cost of the degraded field. If the field were at carrying capacity and a herdsman decides to add an extra animal, the added animal takes some of the food that would have gone to the others. This reduces their value. The owner of that additional animal comes out ahead because even though all his animals are a little bit less healthy, he has more of them. But each herdsman acts under these incentives and will keep adding animals to their herd or let their animals graze longer. 
so long as it's profitable to themselves. But really, they're all losing out. Kind of like the prisoner's dilemma. Contrast this to a situation where only one person owns it. If they add an extra animal, they're only hurting themselves, so they don't do it. Since new people can't be excluded from the field, there's almost no point in boycotting the use because someone else could just come in. None of the herdsmen own the field, and they can see that the field may not be around forever. They see no point in conservation and just try to use it before someone else does. Okay, so we can go on to apply this model to unregulated open access fisheries, open access forests, and unregulated college dorm sink. But the problem with applying this model to the real world is that we have to assume, among other things, that people don't communicate or work together which isn't true. With a field like this, people will generally get together and make plans about its use. They may act as a single unit or just partition it into sections, and they'll regulate the number of people that can use it. And if people are working together and communicating, then it's not really open access. It's not like every management situation is open access until somebody does something about it. So you don't tend to see the open access problem. Because people don't work together, you tend to see it in situations where people can't work together. Sometimes people are forced into a situation where they're not allowed to work together. Check out this video. Also, the larger the management area is, the more difficult communication and influencing each other becomes. For example, the global management of greenhouse gas emissions tends to take on some open access properties. Basically, this model is a way of communicating that when people can't work together on a resource, you call it open access, and it's bad. Which is why the model should have been called the problem with open access. Questions? This episode is brought to you by Hardens Can't... Hardens? I don't know how to control this. This is a model called to do with the commons, and tragedy is kind of dramatic. I escaped. Am I still in my slideshow? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there, yes, there. Okay. Back to our regularly scheduled programming already in progress. So. The way the rules are written about the planet is without, without uh, the kind of cooperation that we saw there, unless we cooperate and try to move towards the best advantage thing for everybody, we instead go towards the advantage for me or my group or my corporation or my country. Right? And in so doing, we reproduce the system behavior characteristics of the prisoner's dilemma. If everyone acts in their own self-interest as a rational agent, it results in the worst possible outcome for everybody. In order to, it, once you understand the system, what it does is it sheds light on the fact that if you want the best possible outcome, the last thing you should do is act in your own individual self-interest, which will trigger everyone else to act, will contribute to the incentive for everybody else to act in their own self-interest. And inadvertently or unintentionally result in the worst possible outcome. Does that make sense? Do you guys have dorm sinks? Yes. Yeah. Um, fortunately, you can talk to each other. But, but Jimmy, huh, he's just, he, it's like he thinks his mother lives here. Right? Who's got that tragedy of the common sink? Right? So you understand it. Good. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, because now it helps us understand how the world works and how best to design within that context. So uh, let's say you lived, you, you were a participant in a system. And the system, the rules of this system are you can take things from the common pool of resources, let's say gold or coal or oil. You can take it and all you have to do is cover the costs of the taking part. Uh, you don't have to pay uh, your share 
you don't have to, nobody's going to take an inventory of the sum total of all global resources and no one is going to uh, communicate, you know, hey, we're running out, so prices should actually go up. Um, instead, we created a system where in order to survive economically, every country and every corporation has to lie about how much oil is left in the ground. That's the only way you can sustain your stock price. You have to demonstrate uh, in your audit sheets that you have 10 years of oil in reserve that will allow you to continue to extract oil at the same rate you are right now or faster. If you come up with, if you show numbers publicly that shows that your ability to extract oil for the next 10 years is going to decline, your stock price will fall. And you're not allowed to do that. You will be fired immediately. The shareholders require us to show that our stock, that our reserves of oil are as high or greater than they currently are. So it's not even an option. No matter what the geologists, our geology team tells us, there is no way. Anyone here in this corporate boardroom who suggests that we should honestly report our numbers, let me know now because HR has a package for you, right? You are out of here. Plus your bonus, your shares. So everyone is going to cooperate and just stay silent about the actual oil reserves. Plus, the faster we, while, ev while we're playing this game, everybody else is playing this game. Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Exxon Mobil, British Petroleum, Dutch Shell. We're all playing this game. We all understand how it's played. It's, it's not a monopoly, but it's an oligopoly. It's close to a monopoly. We don't even have to collude with each other. We know what we're doing, right? We play golf together. Um, so, and the, the rules are that you can take as much oil as you want. There's no market mechanism as the uh, oil supply goes down that would trigger an increase in cost. Thus, the gasoline prices that you enjoy. You're welcome. They're so low. Stop whining. It's never been so low, and nowhere in the world is it lower than here, except Venezuela, seven cents a liter. When Obama came into office, when I started driving, prices yeah. went down to 180. Uh huh. It's pretty nice. Yeah. That's tell me, tell me how nice it is when you're bailing out your basement. Uh, yeah, it's Twenty nice years. When I'm bailing out my basement. Yeah. So, what's the connection there? Why would Obama's uh, buddy buddy relationship with oil companies result in bailing out your basements? Have something to do with fracking? Sure. Anything you say that's bad about the planet uh, suffering, you can add it to the list. It's all related to a dollar eighty a gallon. Really? Or or two eighty five a gallon. Two eighty five is a huge subsidy that the U.S. taxpayers are lavishing on the oil interests. Um, why do you think uh, the CEO of Exxon Mobil was the Secretary of State for the United States? We are so done pretending that there's any separation between the largest corporations on the planet and the U.S. government. They are right there. Rex Tillerson, it's just like, okay, let's stop pretending. Let's just admit ExxonMobil controls the country. Wall Street controls the economic system. Let's stop, you know, there's no point in pretending anymore. No one, you know, everyone's in on the joke, right? So let's just stop pretending. So there's no price consequence to depleting the oil supply. And it's also free to dump uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. There were a few years there where ExxonMobil, British Petroleum, Shell were in the leadership position to say, look people, global warming is real and we, the oil companies, your friends, the oil companies, are going to be at the forefront 
of designing and building a future that prepares for this and eases the transition to a non-carbon economy. They were, they were in the leadership position and they were going to make sure that no matter what change happened, they were still going to be in control of the world. And this is, was their strategy to do it. But then, in 1989, the former governor of New Hampshire um, went into the Paris Climate Treaty and sabotaged it. And then all the oil companies said, phew, okay, you guys who are on the environmental branch, uh, you know, you're all fired or we're going to move you over to uh, rapid exploitation of oil reserves in Africa. Okay, congratulations, here's your raise. So they shifted gears because there's no reason to be the leaders of transitioning to a carbon-free world because there's no consequences. The fat, so the, it reconfirmed and consolidated the rules of this system game. Whoever extracts the most resources the fastest and dumps the most carbon or whatever garbage you want to dump into the atmosphere the fastest, you're going to get the most money. Whoever behaves the worst, fastest, it wins. Go! Which explains, which explains a lot about the system behavior that we're, we're seeing. And so this is one of the clearest demonstrations of a system that uh, it's not natural, it is a man-made thing. We made this system and the operating rules of the system boil down to whoever behaves the worst wins the most. Go. And let's see what happens. This is a bold experiment to see what happens when we run the system. And it's basically an ever accelerating race to uh, depletion of resources, uh, dumping of carbon, the rising of sea levels, species extinction, etc. It's the rules of the system are the nation states and the economic system. And so this is a clear demonstration of the prisoner's dilemma and uh, the tragedy of the commons where uh, man-made rules made this outcome inevitable. Let's say you are Rex Tillerson or the current president of ExxonMobil and you want to do the right thing, right? Can you do it? No. You are so not allowed to do it. If the second you even looked in the direction or even mentioned doing the right thing, you would be fired. So there is no way. ExxonMobil and the CEO of ExxonMobil is probably a really nice neighbor, a good father. He probably volunteers at his church. He's fun to play golf with. A great guy. Great guy. He would do the right thing, and he is doing a better thing than, you know, if Jimmy were here. He was, he was my roommate in college. You should have seen what he would do to the sink, right? I'm CEO of ExxonMobil to prevent Jimmy from taking over. Oh, my God. He would make such a bigger mess of the world than, than it already is. So I am... My highest ethical, and Rex Tillerson, I'm sure, he's not Satan. He's not possessed by the devil. He's not a bad guy. It's a system situation where he has no choice. Sure, he is one of the 10 wealthiest and most powerful humans on the planet. That doesn't mean he's got the freedom to do the right thing. He doesn't. He's in sitting within system constraints that make it impossible for him to do the right thing. You could take him out and put any one of us in there. And we would do the same or worse. So get off your moral high ground about, ooh, we have to save the planet. It's not about the president of ExxonMobil. It's not even about ExxonMobil. No one in ExxonMobil is allowed to do the right thing. The first thing that would happen, let's say that uh, the new wise Jenny takes over ExxonMobil. She says, OK, guys, we're going to do the right thing. And she explains the prisoner's dilemma and the tragedy of the commons. 
and she goes in and she says, we're going to do the right thing and it's going to be better for everyone. What's the first thing that happens? Let's say she actually convinces the shareholders, the board of directors, and the whole company to do the right thing. What's the first thing that happens to ExxonMobil? The stock prices The what? The stock prices go down. Stock prices go down. They go out of business faster than you can say Donald Trump is president. Right? It's so instantaneous. And Shell Oil says, thank you very much, ExxonMobil. We'll take your market share. And off we go. And it actually, the situation, if ExxonMobil, if Jenny took over ExxonMobil after taking this class and does all the right things, it actually makes the total situation much worse. The earth uh, suffers much faster. So this is um, a way of saying that it's not about the personalities. It's not about individual choices, even. It's not about paper or plastic. It's about the design of the system. And every time architects design a project that has, especially if it's a very thoughtful project, it probably has implications for how other projects might be designed. And before you know it, a single project, a well-conceived architectural project, once it gets reproduced, it has the potential to become, uh, to have a system impact. And so projects have a way of producing systems which have a way of producing cultural change. Now, who am I quoting there? Do you recognize that as a quote? Did you go to the lecture by Charlie Cannon last semester? We had a lecturer at Wentworth Institute of Technology who just, it was a brilliant presentation of these principles. They weren't his principles, but he latched onto it. And I was like, oh my God, that's it. I have to tell my class. I did it. Phew. So let's quickly move on. To, let's move backward. We're going to go backwards, and we're going to go to Dutch architecture. Who likes Dutch architecture? Rem Kohlhaas, MVRDV, right? We like, we kind, it's kind of a thing. We kind of like Dutch architecture, don't we? So why do we like Dutch architecture? Let's take a look at that. On the way there, I'm going to say cybernetics is a word you should have in your vocabulary. It's basically, well, there it is. Cybernetics or control and communications of the animal and the machine. So it's a way of s establishing systems conscious of how negative feedback loops work. And when the negative feedback loops are not there, ExxonMobil, uh, what happens? And if something bad is happening, engineers would say, I've, I've got a negative feedback loop. I can just connect up here and then plug it in there, you're all set, all fixed, right? And it could be a physical system, it could be an economic system, it could be a human behavior system. As we saw in Prisoner's Dilemma, it could be a social system. Just by communicating, you can produce negative feedback loops. And architecture can facilitate the production of negative feedback loops because the environment is part of it. You have a cat that wants to catch the mouse. You have the mouse that wants to catch the cheese and avoid getting caught by the mouse. And they, depending on the structure, the structural characteristics of the environment, either the cat eats the mouse or the mouse eats the cheese or there's this balance, this dynamic balance of mouse, cat, cheese environment produced by the environment, by the design of the environment. And you could substitute humans and corporations, uh, housing arrangements. Uh, and who's that? No, he's not that old yet. And it's a black and white photo. Notice the map. What is that map? 
it's the world, but it's an interesting way of looking at the world. It's not warped. Right. It's the it's the minimum distortion based on an uh, icosahedron or something like that. Dodecahedron. That's Buckminster Fuller, who who is he? Utopian. Utopian. Utopia or Oblivion is one book he wrote. He's an inventor, he's an engineer, he's a social mind, he's an architect. What architecture is he known for? Here's a hint, look at that map. Geodesic dome, yes. So he invented this thing called the world game. And he said, the planet is a system. It has limited resources and it has a lot of decision makers. If we can look at it in a global perspective, maybe we can come up with uh, a set of rules that will optimize the outcomes and, and yield the best outcomes. Before we try it at full scale, let's model it. He's an architect. Let's make a model of it and test it out to see if it works. Let's test out different rules in the format of a game. So have you heard the verb to gamify something? so good you're going to college. So what we do now is we gamify things. And he was gamifying this back in the 60s, the 70s. And I am proud to say that one of the last runnings of the world game in Boulder, Colorado, I was there. I was just a child. I was about two years old. No, I was about your age. I hitchhiked to Boulder because back then hitchhiking was a thing and uh, and I saw this man my hero the reason I went into architecture is in high school I got infatuated with the geodesic dome as a senior class prank we built a geodesic dome in our library in the middle of the night um, so I was totally obsessed with Buck Mr. Fuller and I got to be present I didn't shake his hand which I regret don't be shy Walk right up to your heroes, introduce yourself, and shake their hands. Okay, so you can say you touched history. People still play the world game, and it's still with us. You get, see what's going on here? And so this is the whole nudge. Have you heard of nudge? So President Obama uh, read these two, a book read, uh, written by these two Harvard uh, guys. And he hired one of them as the uh, undersecretary of nudge. I don't think it was called that. But basically, he was uh, the engineering the choice architecture of tax forms, uh, of all kinds of decision making procedures and basically it means uh, why so how many of you are organ donors so it turns out that a vast majority of people uh, would prefer to be organ donors but a vast majority of people are not organ donors and it has to do with the form at the Department of Motor Vehicles that if you want to be an organ donor you have to check a box and basically, these guys, these choice architects, would say, how about this? Let's invite people to check a box if they don't want to be organ donors. What happens? The number of organ donors shoots up through the roof, and we have a diff completely different outcome. Jane McGonigal is the champion of gamifying everything. Uh, Let's skip the Japanese. SimCity. Who's played SimCity? Cool, right? You can test things out on the world by gamifying it. And um, unfortunately, SimCity is not as realistic as some of us would prefer. So it's not that effective at gamifying. Uh, are there land values? I'm not sure. But basically, these this whole first part is about how are systems reflexive? What, is, what does it mean to have a reflexive system response? 
So let's look at modernism. Are we, what, what's our current era in architecture? What are the possibilities? It could be modern, post right? Modern. It could be postmodern. Or, or what? The difference between second modernity and postmodernity? Could be second modernity, right? You read something somewhere. High modernism, High modernism is another term. Any other terms? Contemporary. Supermodernism? Yeah. No, S U P R E M A L I S. Suprematism. Yes. I'm going to say no. That was Kazimir Malevich, uh, the Soviet Union, 1917, invented the suprematist school of painting, and it was very influential on architecture until the 20s, through the 20s. And then stuff happened, and we don't even know about it anymore. Rem Kohlhaas knows about it, because he made a very deep study of Soviet architecture movements of the teens. And Zaha Hadid knows about it, yeah. But unfortunately, she passed away. But her influence lives on, yeah. right? So we're looking at suprematist stuff, like the thing behind you. Arguably, that would be suprematist. If you know suprematism, oh, that is so suprematist, right? But not many of us, yeah. So if we had more time, I'd do a poll. But the premise of this um, is influenced by James C. Scott's scene like a state. He looked at big system responses. He looked at Corbusier's uh, cities that we're going to look at. Uh, basically, architects in the 20th century like to envision utopian schemes for cities and they drew it down and locked it on paper and then presented it to people like uh, Nehru in India to build Chandigarh or in Brasilia in Brazil. So there's, there's these visions, but they are, as soon as they're written down on paper, drawn on paper, they are, they are they're dead, right? It doesn't change anymore. They are stagnant, they're, they're uh, rigid. And so James C. Scott wrote about the problem of rigid visions, that uh, there are unintended consequences. And one of the big unintended consequences of rigid systems that we designed in the 20th century is what? Climate change. Climate change, right? We designed this rigid system. It was brilliant on paper. The automobile, the suburban uh, landscape, it was actually, it actually was brilliant. But the mechanisms for adjust, for identifying and correcting for unintended consequences are, are too, uh, are not sophisticated enough to change course, for course correction. So there's no course correction built into the visions of 20th century architectural and urban design. And that's basically James C. Scott saying, um, and on the cover, the picture, who's driven out in the flat parts of the United States? So what's that? It's just flat land, a bunch of fields. Looks like corn. Farms. But why does the road take that? Because they have their own property line, so they need to follow the flow of their own property line. And we laid out the Jeffersonian grid across, well, Jefferson in 1789, uh, inaugurated the U.S. Land Act that established a grid from the Appalachian Mountains out to the coast of California. And the grid was a pure, perfect, rectilinear grid. And then they laid it on this spherical planet and something happened. It, it, it didn't, it, it wrinkled, right? Who's ever tried to wrap up a, a soccer ball in Christmas paper? Right, your flat paper. What happens to your flat paper when you wrap up? Wrinkles. It wrinkles, right? This is at a wrinkle point. The grid, every 40 miles, because of the curvature of the Earth, this east-west grid line 
has to make a correction. And so it's just an unintended consequence of laying out a perfect ideal grid across the United States to make it easier to buy and sell land. It's a brilliant, perfect system with a few wrinkles. But every year, hundreds, maybe thousands of people die because of these, because you're driving for 40 miles, you're going, you know, oh, United States, the side of the road, okay. For 40 miles, right? All of a sudden, whoa, whoa, where'd this curve come from? Boom, dead. All right, thousand I times. Like a right angle. Why would they just have like a gentle angle? Into I know, right? Property values. If they were looking at a larger system, they would say, hey, man, I'll give you, I'll give you this triangle for you. You, you can take this triangle if I can have this triangle, right? And they would work it out. But another demonstration of prisoner's dilemma if you don't allow people to talk to each other, they can't make deals like that. So um, James C. Scott looks at rigid market systems. Uh, the 10 million people who starved to death in the Soviet Union when the government took control of the price of wheat. 10 million. The second biggest human die-off in history. What was the first largest human die-off? Like death? No. No. It was a few years later when Mao did the same thing in the, the socialist government where you control, it's a command and control economy. The farmers need to make a profit, so let's fix the price of wheat, let's fix the price of rice to make sure that they make profit. Well, what if the, cro the costs, anyway, when you, when you play games with supply and demand and you lock the price in one place, there are unintended consequences much greater than what this, uh, cor these two corners caused. 30 million people starved to death in China. The farmers starved or like? Mass, yeah. Well, most people in China were farmers at the time. So 30 million people. And so he looks at, at rigid systems and he says rigid systems are not so cool. Friends don't let friends establish rigid systems. Let's use reflexive systems. He doesn't use that word, um, but that's what's introduced in 1994 with these three sociologists who wrote this book. And um, we don't have time for this. I'm going to skip this part. But you, public housing in the United States figures into this, is another reference point in this history. Um, Singapore is another reference point in this history. So the thing we notice is situations that are ex in extreme peril, they have no choice but to be creative to get out of their tough situations. They're willing to do whatever it takes to survive. And so they come up with new approaches to things like architecture and urbanism that allows them to survive. And sometimes they are so brilliant, they don't just survive, they thrive. In 1965, you've heard of Calcutta, right? The black hole of Calcutta? It was the worst human miasma, the worst human situation uh, of the 20th century. Poverty, starvation, death, disease, Mother Teresa, Calcutta. As bad as Calcutta was, in 1965, a friend of mine flew from Calcutta, where he had spent a week or two working in architecture on how to deal with the horrible stuff in Calcutta. And he flew to Singapore, and he was there for a day. And even though he had just spent two weeks in Calcutta, he got to Singapore and he said, oh my god, this is dangerous. This is actually really bad. It was way worse than Calcutta. Singapore was in such bad shape that it, and it was part of Malaysia after uh, British granted Malaysia independence from its colonial empire. And Malaysia said in 1965, they were looking at how to save the city of Singapore, what to do about all the problems in Singapore. Guess what their solution was? No. It was darker than that. It was, 
you know what, Singapore? You're a bunch of Chinese people. You're poor. You have a strong communist movement. We're Malaysian. We don't really like your kind. And if you think we're going to bail you out of this mess you've gotten yourself into, you know what? We're granting you independence from Malaysia. You are on your own. And so they, they took this island city with a million and a half people and they said, they just, you're not, no longer part of Malaysia. Good luck. They didn't have their own food supply. They didn't have their own water supply. They depended on everything from the mainland. And at any point, Malaysia could just close the bridge uh, blockade the, the channel so there were no ferry and they would all just die. And there was a good chance that that's exactly what Malaysia was going to do. But it would have been embarrassing so they didn't do that. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew uh, was the provincial senator, basically the parliamentarian, the minister representing the city, state, the city of Singapore uh, in the Malaysian parliament. He went home to Singapore where he got on the television that night and with tears streaming down his eyes, he told this people of Singapore that they had been separated from the state of Malaysia. And basically the reason he was crying and everyone was crying is because they all expected to starve to death or you know, eat each other like Easter Island scenarios, really walking dead scenarios here. Um, he said, we have to be serious about what we do so to make a long story short, he said, I'll be dictator and I will fix this. And so he bulldozed the slums. He uh, got uh, grants and loans to build a subway system. And he put high rise public housing towers around subway systems. And uh, basically he used architecture and urban planning to reform the entire city and uh, all housing was public housing, no private housing. And by keeping housing prices low and building really good education systems, fast forward, we have Singapore now. It's a model of the world, the most successful city in the universe, right? Nobody has surpassed Singapore's achievements and they did it because they, they changed the way they think about everything. And architecture and urban form was a, a, a vehicle for making that transition. It would be incorrect to say that the architects saved Singapore. Architecture doesn't have that much power. Um, but Singapore today, my video doesn't work. But Singapore today kicks Dubai's butt in a lot of ways. Uh, it is the model. They send out their consultants. They tell everybody how to do things better, especially China. Um, so that's the history. The critique of high modernism is it's too rigid to correct its own uh, excesses. Um, and I would say um, postmodern, so that's why the prude Igo was there. Charles Den Jenks is the one who said, uh, March 3rd, uh, 1973, at 3.19 p.m., modernism ended, and we entered the postmodern era. That was the moment they blew up the pruitt Igo public housing in St. Louis. Don't believe it. That was a crisis of confidence in the excesses of high modernism. We, I would say, and we can talk about it later, but for all intents and purposes, modern. We are in a modern moment. It's different, but I'm, but the whole uh, premise of this lecture and this course is that we are still in a continuous modernism. By definition, the present moment is modern, no matter what moment in history you're talking about, it's modern. Um, but other than that, we are also continuing the process of modernization, that the principles of modernism are still at work. It's just that now 
we, are, we have to do things differently than we did in the 20th century or else we're just making the problems worse. So that's the second modernity thesis, is that if we continue doing the, same, the things the same way we did in the past century, we are going to make the same problems worse. We are obligated as architects and design professionals to figure out what went wrong and to do something different. Uh, and that difference between what we must do now and how we did things then, uh, that's what makes this the second modernity as opposed to the first modernity characterized by rigidity of vis architectural visions, not uh, failure to anticipate uh, responses to unintended consequences, lack of reflexive system response. So the difference, if we are going to make a difference in the 21st century, we have to do better. We have to produce architecture that replicates systems that have built into them reflexive mechanisms of rapid, automatic, if possible, negative feedback loops that trigger a rapid response to detect negative outcomes and correct them on the fly. Don't wait for the UN to come swooping in. It's not going to. Turns out, fortunately, or for better or for worse, Singapore did that. Before them, the Dutch had a crisis. Who in their right mind would build a civilization below sea level? In the ninth century, when the North Sea swept through the ne Netherlands and killed a significant uh, proportion of their population, some sens pe sensible people said, let's get out of here. This is crazy. We're at risk. This land is too low. But some other people, so Dutch, they said, ah, we can fix this. And so they came up with systems that fixed it. You build a dike, and then you use wind power to pump up, uh, drain the, the, the wet, the lake. You drain the lake, you drain, drain the peat bogs, and you keep it dry. And now you have land that's below sea level that can allow you to feed the country. Fast forward to today, the Netherlands is the second largest food exporter in the world, despite the fact that they're one of the most densely populated countries in the world. Singapore is more densely populated than the Netherlands because it's small. Japan is very dense, but not as dense as the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a very small piece of land, half of it below sea level or at sea level, with a very high population, but they have been able to to design, starting in the ninth century, they have said, you know what, the landscape is the architecture. The buildings are also architecture. It's a continuous system. Let's design things to, with the larger system in mind. And so they did. And so they continuously enclosed pieces of the North Sea. They build these huge engineering projects and then they drain the North Sea out of the inlets and they create more country. The only places that do this similarly are Singapore and Dubai. Uh, these are the areas of uh, land that they have recently, these are the polders. This is a map of polders. Polders are low-lying areas that get drained to create agricultural land. And to protect their scarce agricultural land, they keep their cities very compact. Who's been to the Netherlands? Oh, you're in for a treat. So it says 1850. This is the footprint of their lands. Amsterdam, Harlem, um, Leiden, The Hague, Leiden, Delft, Rotterdam, Utrecht. And here's a polder in formation. Polder in formation. And uh, fast forward to 1940, 1970, 2000. So basically, they've been able to grow. This is about the size of Southern California, Los Angeles basin. It has about the same population. And it has about the same size of economy. But the land use pattern is completely alien. It's the opposite of the 
California sprawl. This is concentrated urban centers connected by rail. Cars are optional. You bicycle to the rail station and then you take it to wherever you're going and then you rent a bike from that rail station long before bike shares. And you go where you're going and then you repeat going back. Um, and they maintain this as the green heart agricultural center of the ring of cities. But then they said, uh, they changed some rules in the 1970s and they said, you know what, people want more single family houses like the United States and they want to drive places like the United States. So let's, let's do that. And the architects panicking because they don't want the Netherlands to sabotage the future the way the United States has. It's a small country. They don't have a huge continent. <clears throat> so at the Netherlands Architecture Institute in Rotterdam, they ran this little demonstration project. They said, um, the Ministry of Housing predicts that we need um, some huge number of houses uh, between now and 2020. And so they said, well, what does that look like? Well, let's look at what that looks like if we do single family houses like they do in the United States. So they made a model of those 78,000 houses. And so that's, they packed them pretty close. And, and they invited their architect friends to design clever, positive out, uh, layouts that would be good. And this is what it ended up looking like. So it, the point is that they did, first of all, they did what architects do. This is number two. By making a model of something, like we could say, we can say, I can say the number 78,000, and you all say, okay, yeah, 78,000, 78 with three zeros, whatever. But to look at 78,000, to have the demonstration effect of architectural modeling, you, the outcome is, oh my God, it doesn't matter how well designed these houses are. It doesn't matter how well designed these little enclaves of housing are designed. This is horrific. This is a big deal. We can't do this. And so this was an attempt to get the Dutch to change their approach to, to housing. Then Rem Kohlhaas and his buddies did this exercise. What if we packed all the 78,000 houses right there? That's how much, at a very high, at a Manhattan density, that's how big it would be. Or at the, bottoms, uh, at, at the uh, bottom of the country closest to Brussels and the, economic, the European Union. 78,000 houses at a Manhattan density would fill that or that. Or um, other densities. Up to, you know, a Los Angeles density would bring it up to here, um, et cetera. So this is a demonstration of architectural methods of extreme scenario testing. Like, is this an actual proposal? Is he saying we should do this? No. It's just a demonstration of how much of the country would be consumed by 78,000 more houses, depending on the strategy. And they continue this. And so this is a demonstration of what architects do in extreme scenario testing. And they tested all these things. And it was basically saying, you know, I was saying how a project can imply a system which can imply a cultural change. They, um, they said, well, let's empty out the green heart entirely and let's uh, build stuff in it. One of their colleagues uh, designed the Oct comp, which means eight camp, and what if the 78,000 houses were supplied using the Oct comp model? If you replicate that architectural project, what would it look like? It's not that they were proposing that, they were testing the idea to see what would happen. What if we took that architectural project called New Babylon and made 78,000 houses using that architectural project as a model? What if we um, only built uh, housing with between one and five kilometers from every rail station so that you could either walk there, the white circles, or bicycle there very easily, black circles. And so this was a way of extreme scenario testing. 
that is a clear demonstration of taking the methods of architecture and using those methods to figure out, to make sense of these huge challenges. In this case, the scale of the entire nation. How do we build 78,000 houses? And um, this is one project. They said this is going to be a mixture of programs and it's going to change over time. We're going to need more housing, less less uh, commercial, et cetera. And so let's make an architecture that fluctuates over time in terms of its mix of program. And so the architecture itself is a reflexive structure within which programs can shift over, over the life of the, the structure. Um, massive change, MVRDV, who's heard of MVRDV? So it's an architecture firm that kind of was spun off of Rem Kolhas, um Office of Metropolitan Architecture. And they said, what if the entire population of the planet, at the time it was 7 billion, I think they should have used 10 billion. Let's, what if everyone lived in one cube, one building that was one kilometer one by one kilometer by one kilometer? What would that look like? And so they do these extreme scenario testing. They say, what if we piled up all of the resources, all of the garbage, what would that look like? So they're doing, using architectural methods of modeling and visualization to test possibilities and to get a grasp of the forces and how it's all working. And then they gamified it. And they made planning into a video game. Let's go to Medellin. So in lots of the world, we have informal settlements. People opportunistically build their own houses because they need houses. They've been driven off their farmland by dropping prices or drug lord armies or whatever. They get driven away from the countryside or they come to the city for economic opportunity. They don't have any land. They don't have, there's no housing. So they find land that's not occupied and they build, they build their own house. And that gives them access to jobs and they do fine. Um, it also works well from a development perspective because the, the developer who wants to build this very nice luxury condominium uh, can easily just talk to a government official, maybe give them a few hundred dollars, and shazam a fire breaks up, or government uh, expropriation of land, or the police come in and say, you are illegally squatting on government-owned land, get out. And then for a very low price, he conveniently has this parcel that he can build uh, luxury housing on. So it works out beautifully. Plus, the security guards, the maids, the cleaners, the people who clean the pools, they all live here. And it's a low, very low cost of living, so you can pay them less. It's a deep labor pool to drive down the wages of people who work. Perfect. So um, we talked about, I think, murder rates in different very dangerous places in the world. Um, this is just to give us a perspective. This is the 2017 data that it turns out Mexico, Venezuela, Brazil, and the United States are, are the places with the highest murder rates. But the highest murder rate in the United States in 2017 was in St. Louis, Missouri, the Show Me State, uh, 66 murders per 100,000 people, which is much lower than in Mexico and Venezuela, where it's over 100 murders per 100,000 people. But I think I told you, did I tell you, that in Medellin, Colombia, in the early 90s, who's watched Narcos, in Medellin, Colombia, when they were going after Pablo Escobar, the murder rate hit 391 people murdered per 100,000 population. And uh, nowhere in human history had ever experienced that degree of murder rate, not, you know, fill in the blank. No place. Um, 
But then the drug armies, with uh, the help of those two guys from the United States, they started to uh, fight and push out the drug lords out of the cities, and the murder rate dropped. Thank you very much, military intervention into the drug wars. Um, and, but then, as they started to make more progress, the drug armies started to demobilize. So all these soldiers who, in the fourth grade, had quit school, someone handed them an AK-47, and they went to war with the drug cartels, they were starting to be demobilized. And they don't have job skills. They're now in their 20s or 30s. They have no job skills. They have no education. They can't do math. But they have this AK-47 wrapped up in their clothes in a duffel bag when they get off the bus back in Medellin. And they're really good at one thing, shooting people. And so if that's what you're good at and you have an AK-47, what do you do? So uh, Sergio Fajardo was a mathematician trained in Wisconsin with a PhD. His father was an architect. He had a talk show and he said, we got to do something about the mess, the corruption of Medellin, Colombia. The drug lords are gone, but our system is still totally broken. He said, tell you what, I, won't, I will stop the theft. You elect me mayor, I will stop the theft, uh, the corruption. So he won by a landslide, by walking through all the neighborhoods, taking his life at, in his own hands. Usually politicians are in armored cars with bodyguards and an army of people around them. He just walked, dressed like this, walking around. And he won by a landslide. And then they were planning a, uh, a cable car, like a, a ski lift, a luxury cable car, for rich people who lived up on the hill. And as soon as he was elected, he said, you know what? Let's not put it there for the rich people. Let's, and so they squinted their eyes and they looked at where the people were dying the most. And wherever people were dying the most, they said, let's change that and let's use architecture. Let's put a cable car there. Let's connect the population of the most impoverished neighborhoods to the subway system so that they have opportunities. Let's create a program where if you turn in your AK-47, you give us your AK-47, will give you job training and an education and a college degree. And uh, he said, Medellin is the most um, educated city in Latin America. It wasn't true, but he said, let's make it true. This was where Pablo Escobar was piling up most of the bodies. So this is the first place they did it. No one wanted to live there. Uh, there was this idea of the metro cable system from Venezuela. Venezuela was in too much of a mess to do it, so they did it here. Have you ever seen this? The King of Spain, Library Park, cable car. Oh, you read the thing, so you know about this. Yeah. So you know about all this. We have no time. That's me hanging out. Rafael. You remember him? No. Alejandro Echeverri, my bodyguard slash translator. Kids with screen time in the library park. Anyway, so Mayor Fajardo, the only, he could only have one term as mayor, so he built five library parks, renovated 120 schools. He did it all in four years, and when he left office, the first thing he did was he came to Watson Hall and gave a keynote speech to our students and people from all over New England to hear him speak about this experience. Um, and we have a video of that. And, uh, and so we've, we have a close relationship with the people who did this. And uh, it's one of the clearest examples of a reflexive system response that looks like a top-down imposition of of uh, architectural ideas saying, oh, I have this beautiful concept, I'm just going to build it. But it's so confusing, it looks like a star architect project imposed on the people, but it works as if the people feel a sense of ownership of it. So I did what any normal person would do, is I moved my family there for four months to try to figure out what's going on. Why do people feel a sense of ownership? 
of these library parks? And the answer I came up with is, it's a reflexive system. They actually talk to the people. And the people said, we don't want this. We don't want that. We want three of these things. OK, two of these things. And we want an auditorium for our meetings. We want mailboxes for our, for our organizations. We want this to be ours. Thank you very much. We'll take it over from here. And so it's an example of high quality architectural design behaving as if it's a participatory, like groovy, homegrown, grassroots, guerrilla effort. And so it takes the best of those two things and brings them together. A great model for architectural practice in the second modernity and our careers as we move into the 21st century. That's all we have time for. Thank you.